Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Jonah's prayer in Jonah chapter 2. An outline of Jonah, Jonah's in four chapters long. You have chapter 1, Jonah running away from God. In chapter 2, he's going to be praying to God. This is what we're going to be looking at uh, this time. Chapter 3, we see he goes to Nineveh, and Nineveh is turning to God. And finally, in chapter 4, uh, Jonah has moved outside the city, and he's hearing God as God speaks, uh, not to Nineveh, but to him. Uh, so that in chapter 1, you have him in the ship. In chapter 2, we have him in the fish. In chapter 3, he's in Nineveh. As I said, chapter 4, he's outside of Nineveh. In chapter 1, we could call that the prodigal prophet. Chapter 2, the praying prophet. Chapter 3, the preaching prophet. And finally, chapter 4, <laughs> the pouting prophet. And we'll, we'll see that when we get to chapter 4. Chapter 2, verse 1, then, says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord. Remember where we left off? Uh, he had been in the ship uh, trying to flee from God. Uh, and uh, the, uh, at Jonah's instructions, they had taken him and thrown him into the sea. Uh, he thought he was going to drown, but instead God had prepared a great fish, uh, dagadol, we said that was the, the word there, uh, a fish, a great one. Uh, and uh, now he is, notice, jo then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the stomach of the fish. <laughs> what a place that he is. Uh, now, he, he didn't take notes, so he, he's writing this, obviously, after the fact. He's not, he's not writing this while he's in the belly of the fish. So this is looking back with reflection on this prayer. I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. Now, Sheol uh, technically means the grave, um, and the translators weren't sure Quite, they weren't quite sure what to do with the word Sheol, how to translate it. Um, and so when in doubt, just leave it as it is. And that's what they did here. They just left the Hebrew word, the grave. Uh, sometimes it can refer to the grave, the, the, the realm of the dead, uh, such as hell. Um, but more often than not, it just refers to the, the realm of the dead. In other words, uh, somebody dies and you put them in the ground. Um, and that's the idea here. But notice uh, Jonah is saying, look, uh, I was in the belly of the fish, but that's really, <laughs> if I can borrow a phrase from the Psalms, we're going to borrow lots of phrases from the Psalms, that's the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, that's the place of death. And he cries for help, and notice, you heard my voice. Now, notice the depth, literally the belly <laughs> of Sheol, um, and that reminds us that he's in the, the belly, <laughs> the stomach of the fish. And so what we're going to see is Jonah's prayer, and we're going to look verse by verse through it, but we're also going to see that the entire prayer comes from the Psalms, not just one Psalm, but from several Psalms that have been grouped and used now uh, as part of this prayer. Jonah chapter 2 and verse 2, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. Uh, Psalm 120 and verse 1, uh, one of those Psalms of ascent, in my trouble I cried to the Lord. And he answered me. That's word for word. Uh, in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 2, I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. And, and we, we sort of chuckled about how uh, it's from the belly of Sheol, and yet he's in a different sort of belly. Um, but notice the depth of Sheol. Uh, Psalm 116 and verse 3, the cords of death encompass me. And the terrors of Sheol, there's the same idea there, came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. In verse 3, he goes on, For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the, the current engulfed me, all your breakers and billows passed over. So notice the reference to the deep, uh, how he had been engulfed uh, in the current. They had passed, the billows had passed over him. In Psalm 69 and verses 1 and 2, we see all three of these. Uh, Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in deep mire, and there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and a flood overflows. You notice engulfed, passed over, overflows. Uh, that same language is being borrowed from the Psalms and yet applied to his particular and admittedly very unusual situation. Uh, notice also Psalm 69, uh, having that same idea of the deep. Deliver me from the mire and do not let me sink. 
uh, may I be delivered from, uh, from my foes and from the, the deep waters. Now, in Psalm 69, the psalmist isn't thinking, uh, you know, in the belly of the fish. He's likening his situation as if, you know, gee, I'm over my head. This is just a really bad situation. Uh, he's likening it to, to drowning in deep waters. And, and Jonah's literally going through a place uh, where, uh, and, you know, you say, well, well did Jonah actually die uh, in the belly of the fish? Did God keep him supernaturally alive? And my answer is, I don't know. We're, we're not told that detail uh, because that's not the significance. He's in the place of death no matter how you slice it. Uh, Psalm 69, verse 15, may the flood of water not overflow me, nor the deep swallow me up, nor the pit shut its mouth on me. And so notice the deep, the pit, um, that's all describing. Um, the psalmist is describing his particular situation, but Jonah borrows that in order to describe the way that he is in the pit. <laughs> Literally, he's in the pit of the, the stomach of the fish. He's in the deep, in the, in the deep oceans, but he's just, no matter, no matter how you describe it, he's in a bad place. Psalm 42 and verse 7, deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. That's figurative language in Psalm 42. And as Jonah borrows that, and notice what Jonah says, uh, all your breakers and billows have passed over me. That's a line that's right out of Psalm 42 and verse 7. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. Jonah chapter 2 and verse 4, So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Notice, uh, expelled from your sight. I'm cut off from before your eyes. Furthermore, nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. That also, uh, Psalm 138 verse 2, I will bow down toward your holy temple, looking and bowing down toward it, and give thanks uh, to your name for your loving kindness and your truth. Um, in verse 5, we see that water encompassed me to the point of death. Uh, the great deep, and we've already seen that word deep, engulfed me. Uh, we see that in Psalm 18, verses 4 and 5, where the cords of death encompassed me. That, that's, you know, word for word, the, the same. Uh, the torments of, the, of ungodliness terrified me. The cords of Sheol, we've already seen Sheol, uh, surrounded me, uh, engulfed me, surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. Job 2 and verse 6, I descended to the roots of the mountains. Now that's figurative. He didn't literally go down to the bottom of the mountains. He, he noticed what's happening. His plight in the ocean is being described in what I think of as landlubber terms. It's, it's just being described in land terms because remember, the Jewish people, they didn't spend a lot of time on the ocean. They didn't have a lot of terms for, for ocean currents and things like that. Uh, they, they had a few, and we're, we're seeing them here. But I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. And Psalm 30 and verse 3. O oh Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You have kept me alive that I would not go down. And there's a reference to the pit. And so you have Sheol, the pit. It, it's, it's two different ways of saying the same thing. Verse 7, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. By the way, have you noticed? Have you noticed that so far, Jonah has not asked for anything? Uh, Jonah is praying. He's thanking the Lord. He's, ta he's remembering. He's talking about how his prayer came to the Lord. Uh, he was fainting away, uh, and then he remembered Psalm 77 and verse 3. When I remember God, then I'm disturbed. When I sigh, then my spirit grows faint. I, I do believe that what Jonah is doing, he's praying through not just one of the Psalms, he's borrowing the Psalms all throughout in order to compose this prayer. Now remember, he's not doing, he's not looking it up. He doesn't have a candle or a flashlight uh, in the belly of the fish. Jonah is, is doing this. He's, 
he's remembering the, the scriptures. He's recalling the Psalms and praying through the Psalms. Notice uh, my prayer came to you into your holy temple, Psalm 18 and verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry for help came, uh, my, my cry for help before him came into his ears. My, my prayer came to you. Uh, it's borrowing pretty close to word for word from the Psalms as he composes his prayers. In verse 8, we read that those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. That's echoed in Psalm 31 and verse 6. I hate those who regard, notice the double reference to vain idols, regarding vain idols. And then finally, we close the prayer here, verse 9, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. And then that which I have vowed, I will pay. And finally, the, the end of the prayer, salvation is from the Lord. That comes from two different psalms. Psalm 50 and verse 14. Notice uh, two of those elements are, are together. Uh, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Notice a sacrifice with a voice of thanksgiving. Uh, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. It, it's saying essentially the same thing. And pay your, and then the rest, the, the next line is, and pay your vows to the Lord. Uh, that which I vowed, I will pay. <laughs> so vowing and paying. And then finally, uh, for his ending, he borrows from, uh, Jonah borrows from Psalm chapter 3 and verse 8, salvation belongs to the Lord, salvation is from the Lord. As we said, so far, Jonah has not asked for anything. He doesn't ask for anything in his prayer. Instead, he's thanking the Lord, he's remembering, he's calling to mind, and he's expressing his trust in God, that salvation is from God. Some lessons now from the prayer of Jonah. First of all, what you learn in the light will be valuable in the darkness. As we said, Jonah doesn't have a lamp or a candle or a uh, flashlight there in the belly of the fish. He can't look up the Psalms. Uh, the Psalms that he has are those which he has memorized. Uh, what did the Proverbs say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, O Lord. Uh, and, and the same idea, we, we take God's word, we memorize it. Now, that doesn't mean you have to sit there and memorize a verse a day. The more you read it, the more that will happen naturally. But I also think it's a good exercise to try to memorize uh, certain passages. Uh, what you learn in the light will be valuable in the darkness. And you can pray anywhere. <laughs> you know, there, there are some places where it's, it's especially appropriate to pray. Uh, you know, you can, you can have a place of prayer. and There's nothing wrong with that. But you can also be anywhere else. You can be in a very common place and still pray to the Lord. Uh, of all the, we could think of unsuitable locations for prayer, uh, the belly of the fish, I think, ranks number one. But you can pray there as well. And then, as we said, this is not a prayer of deliverance, but a prayer of thanksgiving and of worship. And it's okay to go to the Lord and ask for things, but it's also okay to go to him and worship and thank him and not ask for anything. It's okay. There's a time and a place to do both. Okay, as we come to verse 10, it's almost anticlimactic. You know, we, you, you, you know the story well enough. You know it's going to happen. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. Now, it's interesting that it describes the action with that particular term. You could have said this a number of ways. Uh, the Lord delivered Jonah from the fish. Um, uh, the Lord, uh, the, the fish uh, placed him. The Lord uh, uh, caused the fish, his mouth to open, and Jonah crawled out. But to vomit, <laughs> you could have even said, you know, things like expel or, or released. But to vomit is presenting a very particular picture. Because if you look up that, that Hebrew word for vomit, and then look up to when it is first used, it first appears in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 25, where God is speaking of the Canaanites and how the land has become defiled. Therefore, I have brought, this is God speaking, I have brought its punishment upon it so that the land has spewed out, has vomited out its inhabitants. 
That is, the Canaanites were being vomited out. Why? Because because of their sinfulness, because of their wickedness. And Jonah has been rebellious. He has disobeyed what God has told him to do. Also in Leviticus, in fact, it's in the same chapter, the same section, where um, God goes on to say, but as for you, you are to keep my Sabbaths, or I'm sorry, my statutes and my judgments, and shall not do any of these abominations, the things that the Canaanites were doing, neither the native nor the alien who sojourns among you. He continues in verse 8, so that the land will not, and, there, and there's the same term again, will not spew you out, will not vomit you out, uh, should you defile it, as it has been spewed out, as it has uh, spewed out the nation which has been before you. Uh, that is, the land was vomiting out uh, the Canaanites, and Israel is warned, don't you be unfaithful, don't you be disobedient, because you could be vomited out next. And, and that means that perhaps we have in this passage Jonah as a living picture of Israel, that he is a perhaps a caricature, and I'm not saying uh, there was no real Jonah. I think there was. We, we've seen that he's mentioned by name over in, uh, in 2 Kings. But that he's also serving as a caricature and as a type of Israel. And in the same way, Jonah has been disobedient, so Israel has been disobedient. And we're going to see, as just as Jonah has certain attitudes he should not have, so Israel has certain attitudes that she should not have. This reminds me also <laughs> that there's a vomiting warning that's given not just to Israel, but to us as well. Jesus says, speaking to one of the churches in the book of Revelation, the church at Laodicea, uh, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. And, and uh, there's actually some, some question as to what does it mean to be cold? What does it mean to be hot? Might not be what you think it means. But, but that's, whatever it is, that's not a good thing. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, what's not a good thing is what comes next. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. Uh, that would be fine. But I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and lukewarm, that's the negative. That's the incipient. That's the, the useless. You see, cold water, and I've been in the area of Laodicea. You go across the valley. There's, there's a big mountain just across the valley. Uh, it's, it's right by Colossae. And there's this mountain stream that is cold and refreshing and, and delightful. Or you go to the other end of the valley, uh, still on the other side from Laodicea, and there's Hierapolis, where you have uh, these hot springs, and people come from all over, even today, they come from all over to sit in the hot springs that are supposed to have therapeutic help. Uh, and, and those are helpful, the cold and the hot, but, but let me just say Laodicea has an unfortunate water supply. Uh, it had mineral water, but it was sort of yucky, lukewarm mineral water, and that becomes a picture of the church at Laodicea, you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. Notice, I will spit you out of my mouth. Uh, is, it, is it the same idea? I'll spit, vomit, I'm not, not quite sure. But, but you, were, you were in and now it's coming out. And that's not a good thing. And that suggests to me that we also can face a judgment that perhaps Jonah, just as he is a character, caricature and a picture of unfaithful Israel, maybe he's a, a picture and a caricature of us when we are unfaithful. And so I'd like to close. I'd like to close with a prayer. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray, not the, the entire section, but I'm going to borrow from Jonah's prayer, just as he borrowed from the Psalms. So let me close us in prayer. Our Lord, we come before you, uh, some of us perhaps in distress, and we, we cry for help. Uh, some of us who have been maybe cast down, and we feel, <laughs> we, we feel like we've been separated, like we've been engulfed, like, like we've been cast away, like we've been expelled from your sight. And so, Lord, we come to you and we remember. We remember your holy temple, and we remember how you are building 
a holy temple, not with not with stone and wood and things like that, but you were building a temple where we are the building blocks. And so we we remember and we we come to you offering a sacrifice of praise and a voice of thanksgiving because salvation, O oh Lord, is from you. And we thank you for your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.